Hello and welcome to the South Teaching Innovation Collective. This is our first session for 2023 and to kick off a new year we are very suitably doing it on the exciting topic of AI and assessment, very much in reaction to all of the interest uh, generated by the release of ChatGPT 3.5 close to the end of 2022. So we're going to be digging in a little bit talking about ChatGPT itself, what it's all about, and perhaps how we should or could or might react as academics and also just things we should maybe be thinking about in terms of educational development for our students and also ourselves. So here we go. In the end of 2021, this gentleman, Back T Future, as his Twitter handle is, predicted that ChatGPT 3, not 3.5, 3, would go viral at schools and colleges. Uh, and he was absolutely right, but it was 3.5 3 that really did that work after November 30th of 2022, which I'll go, go, go on to in one, one moment. Um, as you see from the quote on the large screen there, there have been some people talking about the impact of these Web.3 and 4 technologies and what they would have in the world for quite some time. So three years ago in this uh, article in the Online Learning Journal entitled AI and the Academy's Loss of Purpose, the author predicted that these technologies would be visible around now in the 2020s, but that they would really only be making their greatest impact. They would only be really felt from the 2030s and on. So I think it's safe to say that given the last six or seven weeks and what we've witnessed in terms of media coverage and reactions on campuses and really just in the education community everywhere, uh, I think we are in for a fairly uh, rollicking ride for the next little while if this is anything to go by. Hopefully we will settle down soon and start to integrate these technologies and figure out what to do with them, but they're definitely having a quite a disruptive impact right now. In fact, just yesterday morning, the day that I presented this uh, live on campus, this is a post that Martin Harbeck of, of Meta posted on LinkedIn, with just a reminder that in the last six months alone, these are all of the things that AI did quote unquote, or accomplished. So that is pretty impressive. And his point really is a point that he also made the day that this all came out, which is that generative AI is really the so-called game changer. And that perhaps we had gotten our predictions a little bit wrong in terms of the, the web three or four technologies that were gonna make the biggest impact. We thought it was gonna be all about digital identities and blockchain, but it's really looking like it's more going to be about generative AI. So we are all allowed to review our predictions uh, it, with the benefit of hindsight. That's the lesson there. So as of uh, this, uh, November 30th, 2020, this is what started to happen in the media. These are all headlines that I grabbed from various articles that I started reading after ChatGPT 3.5 was released. Uh, and they're all real headlines and they really are fairly alarmist in tone, as you can see. Things like the college essay is dead, no one is prepared, should professors worry, will it replace humans, could AI write your next paper, etc. And just a caveat to say that that one in the bottom left is actually an article from October 31st, 2022 from Nature magazine. So just to say that these conversations have actually been happening for some time. People who've been following this technology have been predicting this um, for some time, but it's really the 3.5 iteration of ChatGPT that has gotten people, gotten people worried to the extent that they are now, another real headline here that I thought was worth including, all collectively freaking out about ChatGPT. So we need to have a look about it, see if the freak out is, is legitimate, and we will probably all look back in six months at this recording, I know I will, and wish I had known now what I will know by then. But there you go, here we are bravely going into the future. So what is ChatGPT? GPT. For anyone who has been really not paying attention to any news whatsoever since November, Here's a little, uh, a little um, primer for you. The name comes from the, the full name, Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. It's trained, on, it's, it's trained on a large amount of text. It's an AI trained large language model. So you'll see this acronym quite a bit, LM or LLM. There are lots of large language models out there. Uh, this is one particular large language model. It's trained on huge amounts of text. Uh, so you'll probably hear people talking about the fact that there's an awful lot of information there, but it's not always necessarily guaranteed to be correct. And that's because the text itself is dated. It's from, no, it's from September 2021. And it's also a certain kind of text, you might say, in the sense that some of this web text, Reddit, Wikipedia, etc., 
is um, vulnerable or makes us vulnerable, I suppose, in the sense that it will replicate, ChatGPT will replicate some of the biases, stereotypes and issues that exist on those same sources. So that's just something to be really aware of as well. And also makes it a really great candidate for uh, analysis by students in the classroom, I would say. So uh, as for how it works, it's a chatbot. So that means it, it chats, literally, it feels human. You put in your input as the user and it generates a response. And, and really the better your input, the better the response. And you can actually have a conversation with it. You can follow up, give a first prompt and then say, yes, but I actually meant this, but could you elaborate on that, etc. So I'll go into the prompt a little bit later, but just to say that, that it really is, it really feels like a conversation. And I think that's what, can be quite uh, disarming and also misleading about it because it also, as they say in the industry, hallucinates, which is a fancy way of saying it gets it wrong. It makes mistakes. Um, so it's also unreliable. And in fact, the CEO of uh, OpenAI, Sam Altman, has been really the first out there in the media to make that point that ChatGPT is really not fit for consumption in, in the ways that it is being used quite yet. But of course, um, big business being what it is, people are plowing ahead and making apps and adding layers and doing all kinds of exciting things and getting it out there as fast as they possibly can. Uh, and you'll probably have heard by now as well that Microsoft has officially announced, Microsoft was already an investor in ChatGPT uh, and has been for quite some time, but they have now announced that they are adding it to their Azure uh, cloud computing platform. So quite a lot has happened in that last six, seven weeks. First though, in the very initial reaction was really one of alarm, panic, as you saw from those, uh, those headlines. And what happened was, thankfully, academics like you and me, we started testing it. People jumped in and started using things like this hugging face detector, which is also an open AI tool, um, to see if they could, um, if it would be, if, if plagiarism would be detected by the tool. So this uh, professor on the left of the screen there, Dr. Dr. Casey Fiesler, she tried it out. She decided it was 99.9% .9 uh, good, <laughs> legit, in the sense that it would catch cheaters. Um, no sooner had she posted that than Janelle Shane came back on Twitter and said, well, actually it's turned out and told me that I'm a robot. So clearly reactions uh, are mixed. So I thought, okay, be a good tester as well. I went ahead and I put my own text from a publication of my own into the GPT-2 output detector demo. Uh, and as I, as I found, I am uh, only 0.3% fake. So that's a relief. The rest of me is legit and real. I'm not sure where that 0.3%, 0.03% comes from. Maybe it's iPhone leaking into my brain. Who knows? Anyway, um, that is my own little test. So it looked, looked pretty good to me uh, at first sight. Um, skipping ahead a little bit, I'm kind of jumping around with the timeline. In early January, we had the other uh, major detector being released, and that was one by Edward Chan, who's a Princeton student. So he took it upon himself to create a uh, detector, which he calls GPT-0, which you can also Google and find. And I hope it's up and working because it's received so much attention that usually the website is down and there'll be a notification saying you can sign up for the uh, the professional version that is coming soon. But Chan's uh, detector works in quite a different way. So his is also meant to detect AI generated text, but it does it by analyzing the levels of two things, perplexity, i.e. Uh, how perplexed GPT is by your text, and also by burstiness, uh, which I would probably describe as the way I'm speaking to you right now, as a human, stopping, pausing, maybe having ups and downs in my speech, maybe correcting myself, maybe having a stumble here or there. Those are the things that happen when you're a human being, writing, talking. So GPT-3 is detect the detector, excuse me, is detecting the level of burstiness in the text that I put in there, as well as the level of perplexity. And I'm glad to say that I both perplexed and uh, burst through GPT-2 detector. So that was good as well. I passed that test. So that's quite an interesting one uh, and seems to work in a different way from the GPT-2 detector model. So that's enough on the detectors themselves for now. Um, here's a little bit more of the timeline. From mid-December onwards, we see a lot of back and forth, mainly just between people who are obviously very interested in the plagiarism and anti-plagiarism industry. So the CEO of Turnitin is weighing in a couple of times saying that they can probably mostly catch cheaters, but they're not guaranteeing it, which is probably a safe bet if you're the CEO of a company, not to guarantee too much. Um, the first research paper is published uh, a week later, 
Uh, and this one really does get people quite scared. I think this paper is on ResearchGate, um, and the author, Tio Susniak, basically warns that the, the potential for cheating in online exams is really huge now, thanks to this tool. We've always been worried, or people have always been worried about online exams, maybe more than face-to-face -face for obvious reasons. So this has really just augmented that in the short term anyway. Uh, it was in response and after that then that Chan released his GPT-0, which went, went viral. And then we see a couple of crackdowns that are really quite interesting uh, and really regressive when you look at them in terms of uh, where you might want to go with, with policy. But there you go, quick knee-jerk jerk reactions. Uh, New York school schools, sorry, New York City schools banned the use of uh, the tool on their school networks. Australian universities returned to pen and paper. Um, and then about a week and a bit later, they did a turnaround and they said that actually ChatGPT could be used as long as it was cited. So interesting, uh, just edit to their own plans there. Right, so back to the academic paper by Susniak. This is his uh, contention, this is his suggestion or his warning. He basically says the result of his research from that paper that's posted in, in ResearchGate uh, on online exam integrity. There's a citation there bef uh, below for you if you'd like to look it up. Uh, essentially, his recommendation for what it's worth is that we can only really exploit the limitations of the technology. That's the only way to stay ahead, which, of course, those of you who follow uh, innovations in technology will realize that is a pretty limited time offer because the limitations of the technology, especially because of the fact that GPT-0 is, is free and it's open for people like you and me to use and test, uh, that is so that OpenAI can improve their product, right? So, I mean, those limitations will decrease over time. And GPT-4 is due out uh, later this year, probably quite quickly. So, uh, and is promised to be something like 5,000 times, ha have 5,000, sorry, 500 times more parameters, which makes it much, much more powerful than GPT-3.5. So these are his suggestions and they're, they're decent suggestions for what they're worth. They're basically using images, pre-recorded videos, um, as a way to get around the restrictions of generative AI, which is text-based, and of course, using the two detectors that I've just referred to already. So some strategies, and of course, we have to bear in mind, this is the 20th of December that this paper was published. So in terms of a quick reaction, uh, really quite impressive, but just uh, also just a heads up that that's a pretty short-term plan, I would say. Um, and overall, my characterization really of this, you know, of this uh, back and forth is that this is a, a fairly restricted short term view uh, and made me think of the machine breakers uh, from 200 years ago, uh, close to this part of the world, the Luddites, who were so outraged by the introduction of these, uh, these industrial um, textile machines, looms, weavers, etc., that they broke them as their protest. And of course, that didn't really get them very far in the long term. In fact, it got some of them hanged in the short term, so we're not going to follow that model. But it is a, an, a, a useful lesson, you know? Some people are also saying that the, the chat GPT is this era's calculator uh, and that we're scared of it now, but soon it will be an indispensable tool in our, in our classroom. So I think that's something to really bear in mind as well. And I think us as educators, again, we're, 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 we might be a little frightened of it right now, but I think most of us are open-minded enough that we will go ahead and plow in enter this brave new world and see what we can do with it and hopefully help our, teacher, our, our students learn with it and from it. Because that is the reality, is that students are going to use it. And this is the reaction from, from ed tech, which tends to be much more calm, solution-oriented than what you see in those earlier headlines from some people who are just really reacting in a knee-jerk fashion. Uh, as Mike, Mike Sharples says, Mike Sharples is a professor emeritus of Open University and writes a fantastic series of blogs uh, for LSE. So if you're interested, check out that, that blog. But also he's got a series all the way through 2022. He's also got some in Time Pie Red magazine where he, on his own and also with his co-writer sometimes, are basically giving this message over and over and over again um, that really this is not about the technology. And students will find a way around it. What we need to do, it, it, it's the onus is on us. We as educators need to harness these tools. We need to use them for learning uh, rather than trying to outwit them because as we saw in the last slide, that is a losing game. Uh, a couple of months later, Lucinda McKnight from Deakin really saying something similar. And again, note that these are coming out before the release of ChatGPT 3.5. So this is before the hoopla that we have just witnessed and that we're still really witnessing. Uh, and I think she makes a really great point. 
that in higher education in particular, and justifiably, understandably, we are so worried about academic integrity, there's a, that's fundamental to what we do, uh, but we're so worried about that, that that might be perhaps clouding our explorations of the potential for AI in various fields. She talks about AI writing, but there's lots of other fields where we can really explore its potential as well. But AI writing, I suppose, is really the first one, and it's the one where students are using it really already, as we know. And of course, many people will come back and say, and they have been using it for years. That's what Microsoft Editor was, and that's what Grammarly is, and lots of other tools that give students suggestions on how they can improve their work. This is just maybe the latest and greatest and best version, but it's definitely not new. So overall, what I've seen from the ed tech community in particular is that technologists, because they work with this technology, they really understand that we get to need to get to know these tools. We need to use them rather than trying to break them. So I'm definitely in that camp and I would urge you all uh, to do that at your first opportunity. So on to the next uh, section. This is my point. Students are using these tools now. So our job is to get on board and help with the digital literacy that we have in our ILOs, that we build into our course plans. And it is very much part of our mission as educators in terms of um, helping students learn and refine and use their so-called future skills, which includes things like data literacy, digital literacy, leadership, collaboration, all of these other skills that the WHO has, has uh, identified as being critical for the 21st century and onward economy. So we're into the third decade of the 21st century now, so it's definitely time to be getting on board if we're not doing it uh, really purposefully already in our curriculum. These are some of the tools that students are already using. Um, I'm just choosing one to look at. You can go and explore all of these on your own. The one I chose is WordTune because that one is getting an awful lot of attention as well. This comes from, I hope I get the company name right, it's a AI21 or else it's A121. I'm pretty sure it's AI21. Uh, but this is a, another a company that is developing uh, all kinds of interesting tools. Uh, so a competitor to OpenAI, um, but obviously all, all in the same market. This is the kind of thing that WordTune does. So if you look at the top left and then the bottom left, just for starters, I put in some text from ti uh, Times Higher Ed uh, description of University of Manchester, which presumably came from our own uh, communications department. So just for, just for a giggle, basically, and to test this out, I, I copied and pasted the blurb on University of Manchester and I put it in to see what would WordTune give me back in terms of suggestions. Uh, and as you can see, it gave seven suggestions for, for refining and improving the text, <laughs> which I think the university can take or leave, but just interesting that it does that. And then you can accept or reject the, the suggestions. Um, but what was really interesting to me is that over the last week or so, WordTune has already updated its services twice. The first time they updated to say that they have announced this new add-on called WordTune Spices. So if you look at the top right, you can see a few of those so-called spices, which are essentially add-ons. So you, again, you copy and paste your text in, and then you choose which spice you want. So that means you can add, let's say, a citation. You can add a counter-argument. If you want a little bit more information, you can maybe uh, elaborate. And the key to all this is that WordTune is now connected to the web. So unlike ChatGPT, this is a really important point for, for you just to kind of get in terms of how things are moving this quickly. ChatGPT is standalone, and that means it's not connected to the internet. And that actually is the reason for some of the flaws and some of the errors. It's not up to date in all of the information that it gets. Whereas WordTune is connected to the internet. So students can put in their, their, their writing, their blurb, they will be able to get some feedback and improvements, but they can also then add in a citation or a counter argument. So I would just flag that because that is really an important thing for us to be keeping an eye on because some of those early analyses of ChatGPT essays were coming back and saying, oh, well, we can spot that it's plagiarized. We can spot it's GPT because the writing is so banal and it's very flat, you know, lacks burstiness and perplexity, doesn't have proper citations or it would have citations that didn't turn out to be real, et cetera, et cetera. WordTune now gets us past all of that. So that's a really interesting development. The second interesting development, and I don't have a slide on this because it literally happened the morning that I was giving this presentation live, is, or possibly the night before, <laughs> too late to edit it anyway, um, was they uh, added uh, translation. 
So a real uh, kind of kick in the teeth, I would say straight away to Google Translate, who I, which I, I think a lot of us probably use if we're working with other languages, just to refine and make sure that we've got the right idea, or if we've read a text in another language, we want to make sure we're understanding it correctly. Uh, so again, I did a little test of that. I put in uh, my own first language, which is actually Irish, not English, put in a couple of sentences in Irish. It didn't do so well in Irish, but Irish is a minority language, so maybe it's not top top three on the word tune list. But just a heads up, that will be coming. Um, and again, there's threats and promises here. You know, I think for a university like Manchester, with such a large international student population, we should really view this as a developmental tool. You know, we should really be viewing this as something that we can make more of rather than trying to quash. So I think we just wanted to note that for those, those two really important reasons. It's here, it's now, it's also a Chrome extension. So if you want to try it yourself, you can go and do it. Just be warned, you have to tick a box saying it will read and write all your data. So uh, whether or not you want to proceed with that is, is up to you, but you have been warned. Right, so this is really my point, is that we need to teach students this kind of digital literacy, AI uh, med media literacy. And I'll talk about this more in more depth in a few slides, but because of the professional reality, and that is the fact that people are already using it. ChatGPT is a foundation. It is the base tool on which other companies are doing things like Jasper AI is doing, where they have these templates that you can see on the right of the screen, where you can literally choose what kind of a written product you would like to create. And I think this is where we're really going to see uh, the potential of ChatGPT and similar tools unleashed. Templates are the, are the starting point for generative AI. Once we have a template, as we all know from our own work, I'm sure, if you have a template that makes things easier, you can just jump in and do that. So where does that leave us? How are we going to address this reality that AI is changing the world um, that we are responsible for, for, you know, for preparing our students for? Well, we've already said we really, really need to just uh, take this into the classroom, make sure we're comfortable with it as well, and make sure we know what we're dealing with. We also, as I just suggested, need to really be paying attention to AI media literacy. So in terms of what students need to know, this is just a brief list. Uh, I think I have a link in the bottom from where some of these ideas came from, but there's a fantastic writer doing an awful lot on, um, on the risks um, to do with you know, student, student education, et cetera, the things they need to know. I will post that as well if it's not there. But some of the things that he has pointed out are, are, are here on this slide. And it's really that we need to be able to teach them about hey, how AI works. So that isn't just about, you know, obviously, you know, comparing uh, texts and cross-referencing cross information, but it's literally understanding the architecture of the training data, the goals of an LLM, understanding how it works, understanding that there are biases and limitations to the technology, uh, etc. So really, again, getting in there and understanding how it works in order to help them make the best decisions. And then once we have that, then we can teach them things like what are the best prompts that you might use uh, to generate uh, content. The prompts um, are really the key with anything to do with AI. And I'm sure those of you who are in computer science have heard this phrase more times than you care to count. Um, but there is that overused phrase, rubbish in, rubbish out, or garbage in, garbage out, depending on what side of the Atlantic you're on. And really that's the point is whatever you put in is gonna determine the quality of what you get out. So the more specific you are in your prompts in your tool, the more specific you are, and again, the fact that this is a chat tool, you can put in a prompt, you will get an answer, you can then refine that prompt. You can have a discussion, a conversation with ChatGPT to get better and better results, or have it, have it review uh, and elaborate, as we saw, for example, on, on WordTune. So the prompts really, really matter, so teach them how to use it. Uh, teach them, teach them how, to, how to write the right, the right kind of prompts and how that will change what they get. Uh, teach them how to use it as a writing tutor, as we just saw. Um, teach them how to use it to complete their homework, whatever that means for you, whether that homework is looking at the ethical dimensions of AI or whether it is critiquing uh, uh, an AI-generated essay or, or something else. Uh, you know, perhaps it's uh, having them use ChatGPT to create a presentation outline and then giving that presentation in class and having another group do a presentation that they did not prepare using AI and just seeing what is the difference in terms of what we create <laughs> without hopefully comparing the students groups and making anyone look better or worse than the other. But you, you get my point, you know, there are all kinds of ways to compare and contrast and critically ana analyze this. And I think students really need to be part of that conversation and they really need to be part of the conversation about co-creating um, 
the syllabi co-creating co your course outcomes on this kind of topic what do they also themselves feel they need to know and i think any student in a class today will say that they will be interested in knowing things about consuming ai media what to be aware of uh, when you're creating the content when you're using the content when you're sharing the content on social media uh, chat channels like discord etc cetera, etc cetera. so really just again kind of basic AI, digital, uh, social media literacy, the kinds of things that we cannot assume that students know just because they are that so-called digital native generation. The fact that they are born at a certain time doesn't actually mean that they are guaranteed to know this stuff. We know we live in an era of disinformation and misinformation. So I think really we have to be careful to catch that and get in and be part of this uh, movement to, to educate people about it as well. So educating them on risk brings me nicely to this slide. Really get them in there to practice cross-referencing across various reputable sources. So, you know, again, you can compare case studies. You can look at what an excellent peer-reviewed article looks like compared to a chat-generated article. Um, practice trying to identify the two. See if you can trick the machine. You know, you're going to learn an awful lot about that. Um, teach students about AI alignment and alignment in this sense is not alignment probably in the sense that you might know it it's not constructive alignment in the sense of learning design it's not alignment in the sense of business planning it's alignment in the sense of just truth and things being wrong so AI alignment is really the extent to which AI is getting it wrong and it is therefore at risk of, of spreading uh, misinformation and again of course the, the really the associated existential risks with using these long these, these large uh, language models um, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily go into regulatory solutions with most um, students in, in kind of intro humanities level courses, but definitely anyone who's working in public policy, governance, uh, anything to do with uh, administration, it would be really worth analyzing some of what's going on and what governments and, and, and administration are looking at doing in terms of responses. Um, so yeah, why not look at the case study of those, those media headlines that I started this presentation with, for example. And finally, uh, media. I cannot open my iPhone or open my uh, any search now these days because I've been doing so much research on ChatGPT. My entire feed is ChatGPT. So really, again, understanding how how these technologies are are uh, impacting us as individuals, but also society, and influencing us influencing us in maybe negative but also positive ways. So really, time for an open discussion with your students on this. So a little bit of a change uh, just, to, just to take a moment and just put all of this in perspective because I have really gone kind of full throttle through what it is, how some students are using it already, uh, things we might need to be aware of in terms of digital literacy. Now I would like to really just switch to you as an educator and take the, ne the rest of the presentation, the rest of the time, just to talk to you a little bit about uh, where, where we are as educators, where we've come from, where we are now, how, it, how education and the model that we are using today intersects with and overlaps with web technologies and what we are, you know, how it's influencing how we, how we teach and learn, how we live, and also the econ economic context in which, we, in which we live. So this is an image, uh, kind of a hilarious, slightly vintage looking image. Uh, with the, all the web technologies there up in lovely little fluffy clouds. This is an image uh, taken from the article cited below on creating education 4.0. And really it represents these, the timeline, the trajectory of these three elements together and how they are overlapping. And as you can see, we are all now at education 4.0, web 4.0 and industrial, re industrial revolution 4.0. So we're really at the point where you know, we're seeing this integration of human uh, and computer uh, technology. We are in, you know, we are, it, it, it's having a massive influence as we can see on, on business and industry and all kinds, of, including higher ed, of course, uh, but also as us as individuals, you know, and really I think the, the onus is on us now as educators to look up at the top of that image and look at education 4.0 and ask ourselves, are we also living up to our, you know, what is demanded of us in this context? So are, are, we, are we preparing our students for the, for the, for the era in which they are, they are living? Are we utilizing the technologies to the best of our abilities? Or are we at least analyzing them and getting to know them? Um, so just to, just to go in a little bit to what this is all about, if this is a new term to you, this is a term that, that came about about four years ago now, uh, 2018. JISC, the nonprofit, the UK nonprofit, uh, whose mission is really to, you know, to, to define and create and enable, you know, education of the future using uh, using learning technology and associated technologies. Um, they got together uh, various leaders all across the UK, brought them together, uh, and asked them to, you know, 
to reflect on where this concept of education 4.0 might, might lead. And this is what they as a group ended up with. So this is really, you know, represents a consensus of UK academic institutions, teachers, educators, administrators, all coming together and, and kind of deciding what does 4.0 look like for us? Where are we now? Where should we be heading? Those of you who uh, are looking at this and are familiar also with our flexible learning program at the University of Manchester, this should look very familiar because as you'll know, the FLP is looking at flexibility in terms of pace, place, pathway, practice. Those are those four elements, you'll see them replicated or maybe they're coming from this. They are definitely mutually um, reinforcing. So it's really nice to see that, that, that happening at uh, University of Manchester as well. And of course, in various schools and departments. But essentially what active, what, what Education 4.0 is about, it's about bringing education, you know, from that Education 1.0 through 2.0, which is all about social web, uh, the introduction of the LMS, the start of social learning, the start of the flipped classroom. All of this was enabled by the fact that we now had a, re we had a, a social web. We had gone past the read-write web where you could only just read and write to where you could actually now share and view and comment on user-generated content content. So that was really the start of a new era, you know, back in the 1990s, 2000s, uh, with the start of the first big three LMSs that we have today, which of course is Blackboard, Canvas and Moodle. Um, but after that, we kind of stalled, I think it's safe to say, in, in higher ed. So we got to, we got to 2.0, but we didn't do an awful lot past that in, in kind of mainstream education. There are, of course, exceptions to that rule, but I think it's safe to say that, that many of us are still mostly in that space. So I would invite you just to think about the degree to which you are using technologies or maybe not using technologies, but embracing these kind of digital pedagogies, as I would call them, or these, these education 4.0 approaches to teaching and learning, which are really about student experience, which is active, social, collaborative. It's really about helping the student get the most out of, out of their courses, out of their classes by doing hands-on group work, peer instruction, uh, jumping into activities that have them not just sitting back and listening to context, watch, watching a lecture, uh, watching a video like this, for example, doing what is classified as acquisition in terms of learning activities, the more passive, you know, student as receptacle of the, the sage and the stage uh, model of teaching. But it's really the opposite. It's flipping that on its head, you know, and, and jumping into active, social, collaborative, student-centered learning instead. And I'll show you some examples of that in a couple of slides from now. It's also about how we assess, which is technically what this whole session was supposed to be about. But I got to tell you, once I started jumping into it, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that there was a huge context that we needed to talk about as well. So pardon me for veering all around. I will get back to assessment as well in a couple of slides from now, I promise. Um, it's also about personalized, flexible student experience and learning pathways. Now, this is something that technology has really been enabling when it comes to online learning for quite some time. If any of you have taken an edX or a Coursera or a Future Learn course or any of the MOOCs out there, for example, you are creating your own personalized learning pathways because you are choosing what you want to, what you want to study. Same thing if you choose uh, LinkedIn Learning. For example, Le LinkedIn Learning now has a learning pathways um, capability, which you might not be aware of. But if you go into your LinkedIn Learning account, which, is, uh, which, which you have through the U University of Manchester, you can create your own learning pathway based on what you're interested in learning about and the algorithms, the bots, will start suggesting things to you that of course might be complementary. So that is something worth just looking at yourself for your own professional education. But for student experience, this is something that we're really interested in. And of course, some people might come back and say, we've always done personalized learning. Personalized learning in the classroom means just listening to a student, doing something slightly different for a student that might need something slightly different. And that is absolutely also true. That is absolutely true. It's not that we need technology to enable all of this. We can do it anyway. In fact, we have been doing it, many of us anyway. But this is just to say that Education 4.0 is really kind of aiming towards having this as the norm, as the standard. That that sage on the stage, one-way learning, student sitting, listening, you know, lecturer, professor, not on necessarily a stage, but behind a podium, front of the room, talking at them, that that model uh, is really a bit dated now and is really more education 1.0. It's a bit of, this sounds a little harsh because it's, it's a bit dramatic, but a little bit of a relic of the past. There is still a space for it, of course, but uh, we really need to be incorporating these other, um, these other ways of learning into, into our uh, course design as well. 
So yes to keeping some lectures, of course, for sure, we need that. Um, but yes to really having students use the information that we are giving them in a very uh, productive way. And finally, learning spaces that encourage creativity and collaboration. Uh, you know, there's some universities, lots of universities, including Manchester, that has all kinds of wonderful, interesting learning spaces. Just last week I went and I had a look at the Digital Humanities Lab, for example, in the basement of the Sam Alex building, which has lovely collaborative, um, collaborative spaces where students sit around desks for four or six students. There are many screens on the wall so they can go on, uh, they, can, they can work in groups, they can present in groups. Those are learning spaces that encourage collaboration. They're not set up to have someone at the front of a room, they're set up to maximize student experience working with each other, for example. That's just one example. And learning spaces can be virtual, of course, as well, you know. So we have virtual learning spaces where we can do live online uh, experiential learning. You know, we can do, we can do uh, immersive learning through VR. And there's some really interesting stuff starting to happen already with AI and VR. So watch that space as well if you're interested in immersive uh, virtual experiences. So these are, this, is, this is really what Education 4.0 is about. Um, sorry, I went ahead a, a slide faster than I should have, but there you go. So that's enough on Education 4.0 for now. So again, just to stand back now a second, take a breath. Uh, and just say these are the themes that I'm starting to see emerge. So I've been watching this, as I said, for about seven weeks since it broke. Um, we saw the very initial kind of eruption of panic and then escalation into banning and, and, and trying to detect and all of that. And I think now we've settled into the kind of uh, maybe peaceful coexistence phase of, of this arms race that we saw starting. Uh, where we're starting to realize that the technology, of course, is here and it's more important that we work productively with it. So the more productive uh, conversations that I'm starting to see now are really revealing some really key themes. And the biggest one is really coming out front and center that AI for learning experience is going to be critical, absolutely critical. So I've made a reference already to personalizing the learning experience. Um, but AI will allow us to do probably a lot more with adaptive learning, so adapting what students get in terms of content or activities based on how well they did before. Any of you who have ever done an online test to check your, let's say, language level on a lear language learning app before you jump into doing your, your lessons, that's adaptive learning. And if you do particularly well, it'll, it'll bring you up a couple of ranks rather than having you repeat lessons that are too, too low grade for you. That's adaptive personalized learning. So just, just to give you a, a little tech example, if you've used Duolingo or any of those, those apps yourselves. Um, we already are doing this. AI is already measuring, collecting, analyzing feedback on student progress. Quite frankly, that's been happening for quite a few years now. But I mean, learning analytics is something that I think all of us as academics need to be learning about, learning to use. Uh, and I referred to this in my live presentation yesterday, but just to reiterate it, I think this is really about the role of the lecturer, the role of the professor, the role of the academic changing. Uh, and like it or lump it, unfortunately, I think many of us are going to have to just realize that things like learning analytics, data analytics, um, being aware of the, the, you know, the power of these tools is going to be really, really important just in terms of what you, what you do, regardless of the subjects that you teach. We are all, we're all going to be learning designers. We're all going to be data analysts to a certain degree, not to a huge degree, but to a certain degree. Um, and just to give you a little glimmer of hope in all of that, if that all sounds like an awful lot more work, the other side of it is that these tools, when they are used correctly and they're used well, they can help you with efficiency. And I know that's kind of a dirty word sometimes. <laughs> In certain settings, we think efficiency and we think, oh, cutbacks and, uh, and, and maybe models, pro, you know, productivity models that maybe we were, were, were a little reluctant to explore. But the fact is I'm already seeing from my explorations uh, of ChatGPT that actually in terms of workflow, for uh, academics, AI can actually help quite a bit. Now you wouldn't want to let it do all the work for you, but you can definitely use it as a tool. And I'll show you a little bit about that just later on. So these are some of the tools, sorry, some of the themes that are emerging. AI for learning experience, AI for grading and assessment, which is where we were technically uh, starting and ending today. Uh, as it says, you know, to grade uh, the essays and exams, I've experimented a little bit with feedback. And again, you wouldn't rely on it wholeheartedly, but it can give you a very good start and there will definitely be improvements down the road. So again, if you're worried about how much time and effort all of these new developments might mean for you, you and your, your workload, I think it's really more about reimagining the, um, 
you know, the different types of work you're doing and perhaps maybe putting a little bit more into one bucket than you did before and lightening your load in another. And it will take time. You know, you won't be able to do it overnight. It'll be, there'll be a, a learning curve for you, just like there is for me, just like there is for everybody. But I think um, over time, if we learn how to use these rather than shy from them, we can actually probably make our lives a little bit easier in, in a couple of years from now. It might be a little bit of a bumpy road for the next few months, but uh, I think it will, it, it will help longer term. Um, as I've already said, uh, this should lead to new types of assessment, authentic attest, uh, assessment, you know, social learning, all of those things that I've referred to, I'll talk about a little bit now in, in the coming slides. And finally, this is an obvious one. This is where we started, the no-brainer. AI raises issues for uh, academic policy and for ethical, ethical issues. Yes, we know that. And we're all definitely going to be exploring that as well and figuring out how to proceed with that. Okay, so those are some of the, the key things that I'm, I'm seeing emerging and that are being talked about by various people um, that are sharing their ideas online, you know, publishing articles, publishing blogs. Uh, and again, if you're interested in, 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 in finding out who some of the people are maybe that I follow, that I'm getting some of this really great information from, because it's not all coming from me, I'd be delighted to share it with you because I think, you know, the more, the more we all know, the better. So get in touch if you would like anything like that from me. So for you, first of all, on your own, if you are thinking and you're looking at Education 4.0 and you're thinking, oh my God, uh, you know, what do I do? I've been giving lectures and, and quizzes and essay exams. You know, this is, this is going to mean a, a complete revamp. Well, yes, but maybe not quite as dramatically overnight as you fear, you know. Um, but I would urge you to really check your assessment strategy and have a look at all of these items. You know, is it formative, most importantly? Because let's be honest, that's the business we're in. We are here to, uh, you know, learning is supposed to be developmental. Uh, you know, students are supposed to learn over time. They don't come in, you know, day one with zero and leave with 100% knowledge of a topic without having gone somewhere along the way. And it's the magic that happens in the middle with you teaching them, with you helping them with activities, with them learning from each other, scaffolding their learning, assessing their learning, giving formative feedback on their learning, having them you know, learn from each other, teach each other, do peer instruction, social learning, all of that, uh, reflect on their learning, uh, you know, get feedback, feedback, feedback. I can't say this more uh, strongly enough. It has to be timely. It has to be quick. It has to be responsive. It has to be motivating. And AI can help you with that again if you are freaking out and thinking, how am I going to do this? I can't get my feedback in at the end of the term. Well, maybe the reason feedback at the end of term is such a huge obstacle is because it's this massive, massive, uh, hugely weighted assignment that is where there's just so much at stake. And perhaps you would doing, be doing yourself a, a service if you tried splitting that up into smaller chunks as well. So just, I'll just leave that, leave that thought with you uh, to, to, to mull over. Uh, assessment planning. So if you've had a look at your, you know, your course syllabus and you're thinking, oh, OK, maybe I need to tweak a few things. Uh, here are some guidelines, some pointers, things that you should look at. So check for multiple points of assessment. Distribute the workflow. This is good for not just you, but also them <laughs> and vice versa. Not just them, but also you. Allow opportunities for that developmental feedback. Design assignments that can be done in stages. Include opportunities for reflection. And again, students don't have to send everything to you. You can ask them to reflect in a learning journal, for example, in a portfolio. Uh, you can create a portfolio over time with several stages. You can scaffold assessments and give formative feedback at each stage. You don't have to be involved in every single one and marking every single stage. That's not necessarily what continuous assessment or multiple points of assessment is about. It's about the formative assessment and that can come in many, many forms. And really do not underestimate the, the power of peer instruction because there's nothing like having to be having to explain a topic to the person sitting next to you to realize, oh my goodness, I do not know that topic yet. Or maybe refine your ideas and think it through again. I think we all know that as teachers. It's only when you have to teach a topic that you really realize what you don't know and what you have to work on. It's the same with students in a class. So if you're not using peer instruction, think about using peer instruction. It's a very, very powerful tool. Um, it's been around for a while. It's not new, but I think it, it, it could, we could use it a lot more than, than we do. Uh, peer assessment for formative work, that's up to you. But again, if it's not worth marks, if it's formative, if you're getting peer assessment, nothing wrong with that. Because again, that's what the real world is all about. You know, they are going to get peer assessment in their jobs for the rest of their lives. So why not start preparing them for it, te teaching them how to do it in a constructive, diplomatic, helpful uh, helpful developmental manner. I think that would be a really nice life skill uh, and employability skill as well. 
So if you're thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to do all this? I don't even don't know anything about half of what Marais is talking about. I've never heard of constructive alignment. I don't know anything about learning activities. Well, here we are. This is the tool. This is the area tool. I shouldn't say tool. This is a whole disciplinary or disciplinary area. 20, 20, 30 years ago, instructional design was a, was a course or two that people could take, and now you can do a PhD in it. So, you know, it has really been a growing field for the last two decades because as educational technologies have grown in importance and digital education has come to the fore as part of that, instructional design is a fundamental part of, of, of uh, digital education. So, of course, it's grown in, in, in stature and importance and, and weight and work to do, unfortunately. But that said, there are many short courses out there. And again, LinkedIn Learning, I would point you to someone like Carl Knapp on LinkedIn Learning, who does some fabulous short courses. If you just want to learn the basics of learning design, get some information on things like this, these lovely, colorful, slightly kindergarten looking uh, images that show you there on the left, the Addy wheel, which is the classic uh, instructional design um, model where you go from analysis to design, to development, to implementation, to evaluation, which has been around since the 1950s. You know, has been used in all kinds of training, not just academic work, military training, HR training, all kinds of training. It's, it's and not necessarily online or, or, or flexible or blended. Obviously, in the 1950s, we weren't doing online learning. So uh, this model really predates all of that. But we, we use it just like we use many others. Um, Bloom's taxonomy. I'm sure many of you have seen that Bloom's triangle and the updated Bloom's triangle. But when you're thinking about how to scaffold your learning, that will be incredibly important. When you're thinking about how to write your ILOs, look at the verbs that come up under the Bloom's taxonomy. Google Bloom's taxonomy active learning verbs and you will get a fantastic, huge cheat sheet of verbs that you can use um, to help write or rewrite ILOs. So. Try to avoid things like understand, even though it's in there a lot, I know, as a basis for many courses. We can have it in terms of the kind of a general knowledge ILO, that's fine. But once you get into what you're actually asking students to do in terms of active learning, it's best to, to really choose verbs that are a bit more about hands-on, like describe, analyze, critique, you know, etc. There'll be, there'll be a whole load of verbs there for you to choose from just to give you some ideas. Um, Top uh, over to the right there, you'll see the learning activities. These are some of the learning activity types that come from the ABC learning design framework, which came out of UCL's digital education uh, department, which has been doing great work in this area for several years now. But this is a combination of work by um, two people in the digital uh, education field there, uh, and also is based on Diane Lodriar's computational framework. So again, she has an online learning course. If you're interested in learning about Lodriar and her theories and her frameworks, you can Google her. She's got a course that is usually full, but you can get on there if you try. And again, it's one of those free online learning courses. So there's lots of room for you to get in there and learn about some of this stuff. Uh, and last but not least, on the bottom right there, learning outcomes, assessment, activities, and content. That is the basis of the constructive alignment on which you should be building your course design. So if you're going to start anywhere, start by looking at those ILOs. Think about how you might assess those, those pieces of active learning, those activities that you're doing in class. Think about the activities that you're going to do to reinforce that learning, to teach it, to, 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 to develop it, to help students integrate it, to apply it. Um, and then only at the end, really, do you think about the materials because the content is, is probably there already. It's either a textbook or maybe it's a series of articles or maybe you've got some, some things from the web. Maybe you're going to create some videos of your own. Maybe you're going to do something totally different from that. Maybe you're going to create a VR journey. Maybe you're going to develop a whole new tool. That would be slightly different. That won't be content. But anything that is content based, i.e., you know, a tool or a piece of paper or a book that students use to acquire some information. So in those learning activity types, it's the bottom left acquisition. It's the more passive of those learning activity types. Um, so those are, those are the areas that you can, you know, we can most of us find quite readily. We're not generally going to write a new textbook for each new course that we teach. Um, so use what's out there. You know, this is again, part of the changing role of the lecturer, I would say, you know, uh, I don't want to overstate the fact that there's a lot of content out there and there's nothing new. There will always be something new, but people are, are saying a lot now the last few years that the role of the academic is, is, is as much a content curator as a creator, right? So you are curating from the available resources. You are choosing the best ones because your role is of course to teach, but it's also to guide, to facilitate, to mentor, 
to steer students through the massive maze of information that they encounter now in the world. I think, you know, depending on your age, you, you will have suffered through having to go to the library and look at paper cards, or you will have grown up in an era where, you know, you always had an internet search. Um, and I think there's, there are real challenges with the amount of information facing students these days. So again, our job is really to guide them through it and help them. So, so think about that as well. You know, when you're choosing content, you are curating content. You don't necessarily have to create everything yourself from scratch. Uh, in fact, I would argue there's really very little need for that these days. Um, and if you have something completely original and new to say, then that's fantastic. And you should get that out there and make your millions. Um, but if you could reuse or repurpose a lot of the great stuff that's already there, there's nothing wrong with doing that as well. And I think that's what, that's what most of us do when our, we're putting our early lectures together and we're, um, we're choosing our textbooks. Okay. Those are the learning activity types I've just referred to. I'm just going to zip through it. But I'm just going to pay, uh, draw your attention to this as a, as a resource. You can come back and look at it another time uh, or just put this on pause and have a good read. But these are some examples of each of those learning activity types if you're, you're suffering from just lack of inspiration. Uh, you know, and, and these already are probably quite outdated. You know, this has been around for, for several years. So this will be updated again and again and again. But if you want to have a look, go to the ABC Learning Design website on UCL. Just Google ABC Learning Design. You'll find the UCL Digital Education uh, section. They have a toolkit and they'll have all kinds of resources on this for you, which will be super helpful. Uh, and again, little plug, if you, if you ever want to learn more about this, uh, I'd be more than happy to come and deliver a workshop. If you or your school or your department would like to learn more about ABC Learning Design, I have found it hugely helpful myself in learning design. I found it hugely helpful in terms of working with colleagues uh, at several universities all over the UK. That was uh, a job I had, I had uh, several years ago. And I have found it to be really, really fantastic in terms of kind of making sense and helping academic staff understand how to take what they have done traditionally in the classroom and not throw that out, but really kind of take the analog and make it digital and figure out how to put it into this digital context and use the tools that are at their disposal. So if you'd like to have a conversation about that, feel free to get in touch. Enough about that. I am running out of time very rapidly. So just a sample, just to show you again. And again, if you want to get in touch on any of this, I can send you a, a, a template like this. I can show you how you might want to work together or I can point you in the direction of a learning designer who will work with you. Um, and I urge you to contact your e-learning team. There's e-learning uh, teams in every school, every department. There are, sorry, not every department, every school. Um, and the teams have learning designers as well as learning technologists. So it's the learning designers you want to start with in terms of talking about designing a course from scratch like this, talking about things like constructive alignment and how to, how to plan those learning activity types. Um, and your learning technologists will be super helpful as well, uh, but they will come in at probably a slightly later stage in that, in that journey. Okay, so again, get in touch if you want any info on that kind of thing from me. Final plug, I won't go into this too much, but I think I've kind of said it all throughout. And it's really just this, this kind of, just, just to make the point that all of these skills that, are, that I'm talking about are, you know, uh, the, these so-called future skills are, are a happy byproduct really of this kind of learning. You know, if you use problem-based learning, you are teaching students real world skills. If you so, use social learning, you are teaching them about teamwork and collaboration. You know, performance-based activities are replicating future workplaces. Peer instruction helps them develop lever leadership skills. You know, all of these so-called future skills are the human skills that have been identified and, and people in corporations and businesses and sectors all over every part of our economy, they're coming back and they're talking to people who are asking them about this and saying, yes, we have people who are highly skilled in computer-related computer topics. What we also need are the human skills. We need the human skills to offset those other skills, to, to, to bring them to life, you know, um, to take that amazing, uh, the example I gave yesterday, you know, you might have a genius software engineer in your company, but you also need the person who can sit around a table with a bunch of people who don't really know that much about the topic and explain, explain it to them in language they understand and then work together in a project on it. So these are, these are equally important skills. Please don't ever think that you know, just because of these technological innovations that these human skills are going down, down the toilet. I would say, actually, if you look at, you know, the market research on what employers are looking for these days, it's quite the opposite. It is really the opposite. Um, and it really is our time <laughs> in that sense. Those of you in the humanities who, who might be watching this. So, so do not be discouraged. Uh, think, think ahead to down the road when you will have saved yourself a little bit of time. I know it might be a slightly daunting learning curve right now. 
but that's what I and the other digital chairs are here to help with to try and integrate this kind of knowledge across the across the school so please don't be shy um, so just to give you that glimmer of hope before I finish in case you are freaking out as you probably are many of you that you don't have don't have time for this do not fear AI can help you with this too I mean the irony you can't you can't miss it can you so I talked about learning design well here is an is an example of the generative AI landscape for learning designers and again, I can share with you the source of, of this information and lots of other great information that's coming out um, on, on generative AI and how it is transforming the learning design landscape. Uh, and as I said yesterday, you know, this is the thing. It's not just us that are being disrupted. Every industry, every area is being disrupted. Nobody is safe is the truth. We all have to learn to collaborate and to get along and to use these tools even the e-learning designers, the people I probably sounded like would be the center of the future universe are at risk of being disrupted if they don't learn how to use these, use these tools themselves. So you yourself can use ChatGPT to maybe come up with a very quick draft course outline, get some ideas together, write your learning outcomes, maybe think about some activities, um, possibly even get some, dis, um, you know, some basic designs for assignments. ChatGPT can be very useful in terms of generating rubrics and feedback based on those rubrics. So have a look at those. Um, they can be developmental for us too. You know, that's the thing. The ChatGPT output is based on what everything that exists on the web and elsewhere. So there's a lot of good information that will come from there. So use it as your research assistant, use it as your research tool. Uh, but here's my heads up. Uh, the prompts really matter. So just when we talked, just when I said earlier that talking to students, the prompts are important, the prompts are important for you too. The prompts are important, period. Um, here's an example, uh, and I won't talk you through this because it's all there, but essentially all you need to know about the prompts is it's a formula, okay? Everything you put into ChatGPT, you need to optimize the formula. So this is one formula that was tested and got some really pretty impressive results. Here's another one for lesson planning, again, a formula. You put in what, what the parameters are, what the restrictions are, you generate your lesson plan. Again, a formula. Actually, sorry, this one is not a formula. This is just a, this is just a, a, a prompt. Literally just saying, create me a, a discussion prompt for a college level course on this topic. Um, and I note also, uh, there's, I believe there is a rubric that can be used to grade student contributions. So for example, I didn't include that in my screen, isn't my screenshot, but it is there. So you can do something similar very easily. You can literally put in the same prompt to chat GPT and you'll get the same response almost certainly and you'll get a rubric just to see what a sample rubric looks like. Um, multiple choice, again, you can, you can do that if you want. Uh, I will say multiple choice is another, it's a kind of a minefield that I can talk about in a separate session, but designing multiple choice questions for higher order learning is, a, is, is quite, a, is quite a, a, an important topic. So something we could, we could delve into, but I've done a bit of research on that and that's uh, just, just, to, just to put that in there as well. Just, I don't want to breeze over multiple choice without acknowledging that there's a lot of really, really important design work that, that can go into those as well. Um, feedback, this one is a bit of a kicker because we know that feedback is, is it's such a hurdle, right? In terms of time constraints for so many of us. But just to give you an example, again, if I've been saying over and over, formative feedback, formative feedback, how do I have time for this, you're saying? What is she talking about? Does she think I have 24 hours a day for this? Obviously not. But look at this, here are the six dimensions of feedback. You know, if you go online, what's feedback all about? It has to be timely. You know, it has to be pretty frequent. You know, you have to distribute it over the course. It has to come from a trusted source. Now that's, a bit, that's why I put a question mark in there. Is ChatGPT a, quest, a trusted source for feedback? No, not entirely, but it's a starting point, right? It has to be specific to what the student put in. It has to be developmental. It has to be encouraging. It has to be motivating. So in this particular case study, uh, the woman who, who did it is Philippa Hardman, who's doing some fantastic work on learning experience design and, and AI. She has a really, really great uh, series of articles on Substack. She has a website. She has created her own learning design model. So if you're interested, follow her on LinkedIn. She's doing brilliant work. She's got a course for educators on AI. She's really great. Um, but this is, this is a screenshot from, her, from one of her uh, experiments. And you can see uh, it really passes the test in terms of good feedback. <laughs> so again, worth a look, okay? So final word, well, almost final word, two more slides. Don't panic, really don't panic. Uh, watch this, <laughs> watch this uh, session another few times if you want. I realize I've gone through it all really quickly because I'm closing in on an hour now, so I want to stop talking soon. Um, Get to know the tool, talk to your students, you know, use it to teach. 
uh, develop yourself, develop them, and rethink your class time. You know, save the high value activities for for, for school, for for campus, for or for live online sessions where you see them face to face. Uh, if there was ever a time to flip your classroom again, flip it now. This has been around for a while, flip classroom, you know, peer instruction. They're both inventions, so to speak, of Eric Mazur, who started doing this at Harvard in his physics courses over a decade ago. You know, it is not new, uh, but it is very, very worth a try. So I would, I would give that some thought as well. Uh, and Embrace EdTech, final plug. All of our e-learning teams will be able to help you. Uh, and Cadmus, uh, the, the tool that we are currently piloting in humanities, across the humanities, um, which is an authentic assessment platform, which helps you design your assessments so that they are scaled uh, over time so that students are really focusing on the process of learning rather than the final output. Um, this is really worth a look. So if you haven't had a look at Cadmus, I urge you to do that and sign up for one, of the, one or both of those uh, workshops in mid-February. Okay. So that is basically my, my final word. I've got a few little notes here, just as there will be more disruption, just to, just to scare the pants off anyone who isn't already scared. This is for the learning diner, designers, lest they feel too comfortable in their, in their seats right now. Um, just to say that there are tools coming out to take your job away as well. <laughs> so we all need to be really, really watching this space. Just joking, no one's job is gonna go. Uh, not if we keep up. Um, uh, some reading you might be interested in. This is kind of a, uh, an evolving list. This is from a couple of days ago. Um, so again, it's, it, it's, it's growing and changing. Like I said, I can't open my phone or, or my computer, my laptop without there being about 20 new articles. So really it's as again, I'm sifting through and I'm curating, but these are some decent ones to start with. And if you really, really love AI, well, there's a lot of tools for you to check. So there you go. Look at all these tools that you can jump into as well as all of those generative AI tools that I shared on a previous slide. So if you are a complete sucker for punishment and you'd like to just learn all about this there, you can just, you can go down that rabbit hole probably endlessly. Okay, so that is it for me. Um, I hope that was a bit more useful than uh, the live session for many of you who joined online and unfortunately were subject to the terrible sound quality and me walking around the room. So again, deepest apologies to anyone who had to suffer through that. Uh, and just a note to say from, from now on, TIC events in person, if they're small, they're gonna be in person in the Sam Alex building. And if we have more than about 20 people, I'm gonna restrict them to fully online so that we don't have to uh, navigate the, the slightly murky waters of hybrid delivery until we really have that nailed down in, in, with some further testing. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope that was useful. Feel free, get in touch with me anytime. I'm more than happy to talk to anyone about your ideas and, and brainstorm. I'm learning about this just like you are, just trying to keep one step ahead. So by me, by, I am by mo no means the, the final word on the expert on it, and I would love to collaborate with those of you who'd like to, who'd like to share and talk about it further. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye.